My name is Chris Abdurrahman Blavo. I'm the founder and CEO of LaunchGood, LaunchGood.com. So thank you very much for letting me uh, invade Montreal this week. Um, uh, very last minute, there was a couple events in Toronto. And I was like, oh, you know, on back-to-back -back weekends. So last weekend, this previous weekend, I went to the Max Gala. Next weekend, I have to speak at a Muppies conference. So I was like, you know what, let me spend the time in between traveling a little bit. Uh, so I'm in Montreal visiting my friend uh, Jawad and his family over here. I recommend his beard bomb. Did you bring any beard bomb? Did you bring any elegant no, beard no. bomb? It's okay. <laughs> really, I'm like, I'm addicted to it. So elegant beard. Uh, I'm staying with my friend Jawad. Tomorrow we go to Ottawa and then go back to Toronto, inshallah. Um, and... Part of this tour, as I alluded to in the pictures, this is our five-year anniversary. So we're getting out there spreading the launch good gospel. And the other part of the tour I think is really, really interesting is talking about the Islamic economy and this macro trend. So a much bigger picture of what's going on within the global Muslim community. And uh, I'm really happy to see my friend Yusuf here. This is a really good example of it. Uh, Yusuf is part of a group we have called Like Hearted. Um, and it's like this global network of Muslim creatives and entrepreneurs. And we've been talking on that for years and over Facebook. And I got to meet him today, alhamdulillah. So this is uh, an example of what I'll be getting to today. Is anyone unfamiliar with LaunchGood? Is this their first time hearing about LaunchGood? Well, actually, a lot of people. This is great. Okay, alhamdulillah. Because I'm going to be talking about LaunchGood a little bit. And the presentation is called Deen and Dunya, the blossoming Islamic startup scene, because... As Muslims, we're always kind of balancing this thing, right? Like, you're all here at school. I heard McGill's a pretty good school, right? Maybe as good as University of Michigan. It's in my school. <laughs> also, I heard you guys are more like Harvard or Canada. Is that, right? is that it? No, no, no. Harvard is uh, Canada's. So, yeah, you guys are striving for good, good establishment in this dunya, in this world, get good jobs, good careers. But we know that our intention should be for the hereafter. And it's this balance that we're always, you know, uh, dancing with. Um, and it's a balance that our civilization as Muslims has been dancing with. And so I'm going to start off with this picture. Anyone know where this is? I think it's smart. You guys are too smart. What, what did you say? That's the Kaaba. What? The Kaaba? Oh, good, good, good. Wrong. 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 Honestly, like 95% of the time I say this, do this, like no one can guess what it is. So, Hamza, you guys are pretty well educated. And what what is the middle of this city represent? So the central feature of Baghdad when it's first built. It's like a great mosque. No. What did you say? Dar al Hikmah. Dar al Hikmah. Okay, so quick history lesson. You guys all know this. The, you know, modern day Iraq is sort of known as the cradle of civilization. civilization. And its ancient name is Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. And so you have things in Iraq that are thousands and thousands of years old. Baghdad is really old. I mean, it's much older than Montreal or like any city in America. But relative to other things in Iraq, it's not old. It's actually kind of a new city. Because was this city, did this city exist during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It didn't. Who built it? Anyone know? Yeah. And do you know the caliph name? Nope. Um, Al-Mansur, yeah. Okay, so Al-Mansur built the city, and you can see even in the architecture and the urban design is so creative, so unique, and we know that in, in some ways this was our golden era, our golden age for the Muslim civilization, and of course Dar al-Hikmah was uh, this, you know, the gathering place of scientists, luminaries, philosophers, people of knowledge, and I, I'm sure, let's go around the room and name some of the things Muslims are responsible for. What are we responsible for? Mathematics. Okay, who's the famous algebra guy? al Okay, another one. Medicine. Medicine, okay, the famous medicine? Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina. And who's the guy with the eyes? Did the eyes help with ophthalmology? Ibn Haytham. All right. And then uh, who's the guy that did flying stuff? Abbas ibn Fatanas. Abbas ibn Fatanas. And we know all these, right? There's so many. And not also to neglect <coughs> the spiritual side. I mean, subhanAllah, we had philosophers and spiritual masters like uh, Ibn Sina, Imam Ghazali, 
so many people, uh, even if you think about like uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, uh, Imam Shadili, like so many people that have enriched all of civilization. Even, uh, you know, a really fun one I was looking at today is, uh, so everyone knows the big, the big thing that happened Saturday night. What was the big thing that happened Saturday night? Khabib, yeah. yeah. right? Yeah. Whose grandfather was a Morshid or a student or Khalifa of? Pakistan. Yeah, well, the Shani, Imam Shamir, right? Really? Yeah. yeah, so we've got all these like famous, you know, awesome Muslims in our history, and sometimes we get lost in this history, right? Like we only look backwards. But there's something else we need to look backwards at if we're honest. So where is this? Andalus. It is Andalus. That's very good. And you have so smart. It's like, what's the point? All right, so this is Andalus. Is this what you used to see when you think of Andalusia? We're used to seeing Alhambra Palace, which is beautiful. What's a beautiful calligraphy all over Alhambra? There's no conqueror except God. And actually, if you look at so many of those early Muslims in Spain, they're so sincere in their intention in establishing it, right? It wasn't like, we're so special. It's like, La illallah. Like, you know, basically, all this beauty, all this success we've had, we only attribute it to God. We couldn't have had a, a, a minutia. Uh, of success without his permission. Now, this was uh, a later caliph over there in Andalusia. His name was Abdurrahman III. And he wanted to build a city that would represent not God's glory, but their glory. Their, uh, what's their caliph? The, their caliphate was the, um, the Umayyad, the second coming of the Umayyad dynasty, right? So they wanted something that reflected the, the beauty, the strength, the honor of the Umayyads, not of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not of this, you know, Islam. And so he built a city called Medina to Zahra. Who can translate that? Like the city of the flowers. A city of adornments, you could say. Is that a good translation? Zahra. 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 <laughs> nah, you say flowers. Maybe, yeah. As I understand yeah. it, more like adornment in this situation. And it's supposed to be like the, the key adornment of their, their empire. And it lasted about 100 years. And it's piled in moons today. So it's a lesson for our Muslim community. I always believe that our success, it comes when we connect that success back to God, attribute to Him. There's a, a famous saying of Umar ibn al-Khattab, I anyway, paraphrase, is that the Arab, we Arab were nothing. We were like so lowly, and God honored us with the Quran, honored us with Islam. And if we are to seek honor through anything other than that, we'll be disgraced once again. And I think this fairly summarizes what's happened to the Muslim world, right? We don't have a central state of power, or even like a, before at least we had a couple central states of power, we've got like zero now, right? And we're split up into hundreds of countries, and you know, uh, we fall nationalism and all this stuff, and I'm not going to go crazy here, don't worry, but it's like, you know, clearly as an ummah we leave, and we got like our country in Palestine, and we can't do anything about it, you know? Uh, and, and many, many more examples. Um, so, it feels sometimes like a little bit of a lost cause. But in fact, I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic because I believe there's a rebirth happening or a renaissance within the global Muslim community. And this is something to me that represents the heartbeat of that global Muslim community. Does anyone know what... Well, you don't know what I'm talking about this. It's called a Twitter heat map. So when people tweet something with a hashtag, this map was, was tracking it. And about four, four years ago, four and a half years ago, an event happened here that quickly caught fire. In, uh, and it spread, it became the number one trending hashtag on Twitter three times more than Valentine's Day. And this was right around Valentine's Day. It really caught Twitter by storm. And what was this event? Well, if you look, does anyone want to take a guess where this is? Yeah. Is that the Boston Marathon? Close. So it actually goes south of Boston. Boston's a little higher up. Yep. North Carolina. North Carolina. Chapel Hill shooting. That's right. Chapel Hill shooting. So you guys remember Chapel Hill shooting? Three beautiful young Muslim students, Dia, Yusuf, and Razan, were executed by their neighbors in their apartment. And uh, it, it went viral. Now look what happened. Let's, let's take a kind of figure out what happened here. So people start tweeting about it. It spreads quickly across the U.S. There's some catch of it in, in, in the Middle East, spreads to Europe, spreads to Southeast Asia, spreads all the way down to Australia, New Zealand, South America, South Africa. This is, like I said, the heartbeat 
a visualization of the heartbeat of our Uma. And what's cool about this is I actually have, we have a term for this within Ramsgrove. We call these, uh, I'm going to skip one, we call these gummies. Not the Haribo style gummies, though. Okay? What is this? This is global urban Muslims who are educated in English speaking. Okay, so I think Riyadh came back to the room or he leaves. Okay, good. You're from Canada. Yeah. Well, well, no. Yeah, yeah. You're from yeah. Lebanon. Yes. But you're in Canada now. Yeah, yeah. And you've probably traveled a lot. You've been to Dubai. Exactly. Maybe you grew up yeah. there. Indeed. Right? Did you ever go to, like, I don't know, Malaysia or anything before? Singapore? Uh, not yet. <laughs> not yet? Okay, where else have you traveled? Uh, Cambodia, France. You're in Cambodia. Okay, let's say Cambodia. Yeah. Did you go to any masjids in Cambodia? Uh, I did not, so I met some Muslims oh. there. You met some Muslims? Yeah. Were you able to communicate with them? With what language? English. English, yeah. right? And did you feel like they were totally foreign from you, or did you feel connection? No, actually, like I found the connection, considering they were the only people we found that we could talk. Subhanallah, right? Yeah, yeah. Has everyone had that experience before? You can go to any country in the world and instantly make a connection with people. I'm confident right now, if I was to get on a plane and show up in Nairobi, I could just kind of go to a mosque, find somebody who can speak English with me, and they'd invite me over and give me some tea and, you know, maybe slaughter a sheep for me. Like, it, you know, that, is that, would anyone be surprised by that? We're all used to that. Like, subhanAllah, the Muslim culture is so generous and, and really our hearts connected. And the Prophet said, the Muslim ummah is like one body, right? And if one part is afflicted, the whole body will get fever and be afflicted by it. Uh, so our hearts are still alive, right? And I, and I pointed it as uh, this example that we can see those hearts are still alive. And the internet is giving us a chance to make something of it, right? There's all this, uh, any engineers in the room, right? I feel like we just got all this potential energy in the ummah, and we can convert it to kinetic energy through, through what? Work. Through, well, through in the media, I was going to say, through internet, right? Like, now we can start working across borders, even if our passports don't let us go there. Uh, and another example I have of it was this. What's this? He can say it like a pro. I guess it's called Ertugal. I got I'm gonna American style. So this is Ertugal. Anyone not know Ertugal? Okay, we've got someone. Alright, Ian, explain them what is Ertugal? What is this? It's uh, the most popular show in Turkish TV history, and it's about the father of the founder of the Ottoman Empire. And it's like very fictionalized, but it's uh, notable because it's like a big budget you know, popular TV show, like action, drama, that has like Islamic themes. Yeah, so this is like uh, Braveheart meets Turkey or something, right? But it really, it's based off the founding fathers in a sense of the modern, uh, of uh, the Ottoman Empire. And it's become viral. Like even, um, I think on Netflix is one of their all-time seen series ever on Netflix. Like probably hundred over 100 million people have seen this show now in all sorts of languages. Now, I used to be a film producer, and I'll talk about my history in a moment. And when I, you know, and I've been Muslim a long time, I'll also talk about that, but, you know, in film production, we were trying to make Muslim movies that were based off of uh, Muslim values, not even, like, explicitly Islamic, but good Muslim values, sort of like this, not maybe a little more modern than this, but it's really hard to find people to invest in this because they're like, what examples of success do you have? So before this in the Omar series, what are like examples of good movies made by Muslims or TV shows? Last Messenger. Okay, the, the, the message. message. Yes, yeah, right. Message. Maybe you could add in Line of the Desert. Yeah. Well, I'll give that to you. Those great movies. movies. Yeah. How many years ago was that? <laughs> it was like in the 60s or the 70s. Yeah. So we got the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, like three decades of nothing. So after a while, people are like, oh, Muslims may, must just not like this stuff. Then we start doing something like this, and it works. So what's the difference? How come all of a sudden this worked and other stuff didn't? It was done well. What's that? It was, it was done well. That's real simple. It was done well. I, when I became Muslim, uh, it was 2001, and someone offered me a halal burger. And I'm obviously like a white American, right? So I love burgers. I'm like, yeah, man, I want a halal burger. This is going to be great. And then I get this, like, kafta between, like, Wonder Bread. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I'm so disappointed, you know? And now, today, 
you fast forward, and I notice it in Toronto, at least I notice it here in Hero Burger, I notice it definitely in Michigan. If someone offers you halal burger, is that a good or a bad thing? Great. It's a it's great, great thing, man. Even in Michigan, like among non-Muslims, they know like halal burgers are like really good burgers. And what's changed? The quality, right? So if we can get the quality right, actually the stuff that we produce can go become very popular and benefit a lot of people, not even just our own community. So again, we got gummies. I'm going to refer this again. Uh, one thing that's really interesting about this market is global urban Muslim uh, market that's educated English speaking is how big do you think this is? How many how many Muslims are in Canada? Uh, approximately, you don't have to be exact. Two million. Okay, two million. That's not high side, but that's all right. We'll go with it. How many in America? Uh, United States. Five million. All right, let's go with five. I think it's a little more. Accurate. The problem is Muslim numbers. I mean, we like exaggerate and we make up all sorts of stuff, but it's fine. So let's say we got seven million Muslims in North America. Okay. Um, that's part of this market. So we say, you know, this is about 7 million people. But then you got to add in Singapore, a few, few hundred thousand. Uh, you got to add some people in Malaysia, not everyone in Malaysia, but it's, you know, people live in Kuala Lumpur, Penang, some of the big cities. You got to add people that live in the UK, people that live in New Zealand, Australia, South America, South Africa. Start adding these up, the ones in Lebanon. How much do you think this adds up to? 60 million. Okay, 60 million, a little higher. Wow. 50, 50, and 100. As my assistant there. Yes, Omar. Do you have a comment? <laughs> you want some nana? Okay. Oh, uh, worries. Someone said 100 more? 100. More? 120? They're saying, you know, the, we don't have exact estimates, but somewhere between two and 300 million. Right? So let's go with, make, make the math a little easier. Let's go with 240 million, okay? Let's say there's 240 million. How many people live in Canada? 36 million. Okay. So we've got almost eight times the market size of Canada. And again, this is actually a pretty good market because it's educated. They got, generally speaking, pretty good jobs, pretty good spending, spending power, right? We know this, like Muslims drive sometimes Teslas to the masjid, right? We got some good spending power. This is a real market. Like if it was a country, 270 million people, that's got to be what, top, uh, four. top four countries in the world? top five countries in the world, it'd be huge. Now, the problem is we can't do it. You know, there's a lot of issues, like we're separated by borders, every country that we exist in has their own laws. But again, I think the internet gives us the power to work collectively in a way that we haven't done in a long, long time. All right, and I'm gonna give a story, the story of LaunchGood, my, my company that I started, because I think it illustrates some of the trends that we're seeing in this market. It's very global, like I said, it's very young, it's very Western driven. Uh, so I was just talking about Yusuf about this event we have got coming up in a couple weeks in Dubai called the Global Islamic Economy Summit. And they have these awards and um, uh, pitch competitions, all this stuff to try to spur the Islamic economy. And every year, more than half the awards are won by Muslims in either the US, Canada, UK, or Australia. It's like four countries that have a collective population of less than 10 million Muslims, like less than 1% of the Ummah, are winning 50% of the entrepreneurship awards. And if you take out the really boring like Islamic banking awards, they're winning like 90% of the awards. Because there really is a kind of this Western hegemony rules the world, and a Western way of thinking wins. But if we use our values, we can transform the, the, the companies that are coming out of it. You know, one thing I like to think about is we're essentially being here in, in, in the West, we're in the belly of the beast. You guys get that? Like you go to Mecca and what's across the street from the Haram? Rolex. Rolex. McDonald's. McDonald's. McDonald's Rolex, five McDonald's. guys. It's ridiculous. Giant McDonald's. power. Right? Like, like it's Western culture, Western products. But if we start generating those things, we can have Muslim, like driven by Muslim values and they can spread across the world. So we have... Uh, if anyone here heard of startups? We've got some startup people. Anyone listen? No one's into startups here? What are y'all doing? You want to work for people? That's so boring. Okay, a few startup people. You listen to the startup podcast by Alex Bloomberg? Startup podcast? Chris Saka, you guys know who Chris Saka is? Shark Tank? Okay. Uh, so there's a famous investor, Chris Saka. His question when he, 
he meets entrepreneurs is what's your unfair advantage? I'm not going to give you money unless you got some unfair advantage that you can be all your competition with. And his, you know what our unfair advantage is? We're Muslims, but we're in the West. We're in the belly of the beast, but we have the chance to move into the heart of the beast and transform it. And that's the prophetic responsibility. All right, so now I'm going to get into Launch Good. Launch Good, I mentioned, was started uh, by me. Who am I? Uh, my name is Chris. I'm obviously a convert. When I convert in 2001, and this is my best friend. Let's see, anyone know? You know who my best friend is? It's not Jawad. But uh, Jawad, you're a good friend, man. You're a good friend. <laughs> they just think all white people look alike. Right. <laughs> uh, this is my friend Michael Abdullah Dan. If you want a really good scholar to come, sometimes he's down at University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. Um, but this is us when we were 16 years old. Alhamdulillah, I just uh, become Muslim, and if uh, I think you're a convert too, right? All right, so I don't know, this is your, how long ago you convert? Year and a half. Year and a half, okay, mashallah. Ian's probably still on the stage. So you become a new Muslim, you're full of zeal and energy. I know Jawad was like this, right? Like you're put on the thobe and, you know, Allah Akbar, right? <laughs> you're going to convert all your friends to Islam. I was feeling really good. And three months later, what happened? Three months after we became Muslim. Yeah. What? 9-11. 9-11, right? The Twin Towers got attacked. Very traumatic. For one, my mother was flying that day, so the first thought, and out of Boston Logan, which is the airport where a lot of terrorists came out of, so that was my first panic attack. I was like, oh, was my mother in one of the flights, how she wasn't. Then the next thing is like, all right, who did this? And I only been Muslim three months. Like, I didn't know, actually, and I didn't even know Muslims. Because I knew Mike, he converted to Islam because of our tennis coach who was Muslim, so those are two Muslims. And then I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. So those are my three Muslims. Like, that's it. I didn't know anyone else in the school. There was no masjid nearby. The masjid was about an hour away. We grew up in Amherst, Massachusetts. So it's like a kind of a farm town in Western Massachusetts. So, you know, I'm like, I'm like, who did this? And then all of a sudden I see this picture of Osama bin Laden on TV. And you have to understand something as a convert, especially as a very isolated convert pre-9-11 where the amount of, information that Islam is very limited. Someone asked me, am I Sunni or am I Shia? And I'm like, what did you say? Like, I don't even understand what those words are, you know? Like, I'm so confused. Um, you don't know anything. You don't know Arabic. You haven't read the Quran, probably even cover to cover. You don't know the Hadith. You don't know anything. And you rely on visual clues or cues to help you, you know, figure out who knows what they're talking about and learn from them. So what are some visual Choose that someone is knowledgeable. So a beard? Turban. So beard, turban, right? And who does that describe? Osama bin Laden. <laughs> Honestly, I cried the night I saw Osama bin Laden. They were playing clips of him on CNN. I cried because I'm like, he's quoting the Quran. He's left the dunya of Saudi Arabia for like jihad, kisidilillah, and God forsaken caves in Afghanistan. Like everything he's sound, saying sounds right except the content, right? Like, I mean, like, it's just, it's the right veneer, but what is this thing? And so that sent me off on my own journey to make sure I made the right choice to make sure I understood Islam. And, you know, one of the big blessings of my life, I've been able to travel a lot. So I've been able to go to places like Turkey, I lived for a couple months, Morocco, lived there, studied Arabic, uh, Malaysia, um, not in here is Jordan, I've also got to say Eric there, and then even the Hajj. So I got to do all these travels before I was, uh, let's say, 22 years old, alhamdulillah. Um, and what I learned and what I realized, and after all that, I became certain that Islam is not this, you know, Islam of Osama bin Laden. It's Islam of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's Islam that we all know, I know in this room and cherish, that uh, you know gave birth to beautiful civilization, to... Uh, the, this history, this legacy that from algebra to modern mental health, um, the Islam that, you know, we see in Khabib, right, or even Muhammad Ali, but this was the Islam. And the other thing I realized is that Muslims were really cool. Like, we're awesome. You know, there's like this, and I realized we have a horrible PR. No, really, honestly, Muslims are great people. I met a convert from here, actually, uh, from Montreal, Maybe some of you know him. His name is Eduardo. Anyone know Eduardo? He works for Human Concern International, HCI. So, do you know his story? I mean, I'm going to tell a story. He was here in Montreal. He, he, he didn't know any Muslims, but he was so scared of Muslims 
that he thought they should all just be like banished from the country, like sent away or sent into prison. And then he had a friend come from Morocco named Osama, which is gonna matter. That's even worse. Now he's got this, this kid Osama shows up. But he's kind of cool, so he's like, I don't like his Muslim, but he's you know I'm friendly with him, and he's hanging out with him, and then one time he's invited to Morocco and he goes and he's staying um, uh, with his brother-in-law, his brother-in-law, and he's really nervous. And he goes, um, you know, they gave him his own room, so he's sitting there watching TV late one night, and he's like, he's having trouble falling asleep because he's like, you know, they've been so nice to me, it's like, they're being too nice, like something is, they're going to do something to me, like they're way too nice. And he's, he's afraid to fall asleep, he's maybe going to murder him in his sleep. But he's watching TV, and he's thinking, okay, maybe it'll be okay, and he's starting to get sleepy, and all of a sudden, he hears someone wake up, and they start walking, he's like, oh no, this is it, <laughs> and then they go to the bathroom, and he's like, oh, alhamdulillah, it's just bathroom, and they come back, and he's like, okay, I think they're going back to sleep, and then he hears, oh, and he starts reading Quran, and he's like, subhanallah, this is the, the prayers they do right before their suicide attack, <laughs> <laughs> and he's really nervous, and the guy finishes praying, and he's still in his room on the, the like recliner with the TV on. And he hears footsteps come closer and closer to the door. And he's like, oh no, this is it, this is it. So he plays like dad basically. He pretends he's asleep and the guy opens the door. And he comes up right close to him. And like checks to make sure he's not awake. And he grabs the remote off his hand, turns off TV, grabs a blanket and covers his hand, turns off light and walks out. And I was like, subhanAllah, he thought he was going to kill him. And instead, he was like tucking him in. And he said, you know, Brother Chris, in my life, only four people have ever put a blanket on me. My mother, my father, my grandmother, my grandfather. And he realized that everything he had, you know, thought about Muslims was wrong. And that's, you know, honestly, alhamdulillah, you know, we got a lot of issues in the community. I'm not denying that. Um, but we got, for the most part, we're actually really great people. And they're really great cult communities, cultures across the world. Um... So we have a PR problem. How do we fix that PR problem? Well, what's one way? The internet. The internet? Okay, that's pretty broad, though. Make more cool shows. shows. Make more cool shows, right? So I mean, I went into film. I mentioned that early on. Uh, Ian was paying attention. Thank you. So we made a movie. My uh, friend of mine from college, super talented, his name is Sultan Sharif. And he made a movie based off his life as a black Muslim growing up in Detroit. It's funny. It's serious. It's a good movie. Um, and it ended up in Sundance Film Festival. You guys know Sundance? Yes. It's like a big deal if you're an independent filmmaker. It's like, the, it's like the peak of the mountain. Like we were so excited. And we realized that this is an opportunity to actually make money off this bootstrap film we did. And we needed to get, you know, uh, do some color corrections, sound corrections, build a website, produce DVDs, all this stuff. Which takes money. money. And we were, you know, you hear the, the, the expression, starving artists? Like we were starving artists, okay? So we're, this is 2010, we're like, oh man, what are we going to do? We tapped out our investors, we don't have any money left. And then we had a friend from New York called, uh, or we talked to a friend from New York, and he said, well, you guys should check out this new website called, anyone know? Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Yeah, Kickstarter. Brand new website, it was a year old. We were the first Muslims to use Kickstarter. And we had a goal of 18000 we ended up with $22,000. It was like a very successful campaign. And I'm the business guy, I'm not the, I'm not the filmmaker, I'm the, I was the executive producer, so I'm the business guy and the numbers guy, and I'm like, man, this is so cool, like, we could just take this to the people, and people were giving us $5 to $500, and we could just do this idea. And I became a big fan of Kickstarter, and I noticed something else, I wasn't the only person inspired by it. All of a sudden, there's this kind of entrepreneurial revolution happening in the United States, where people with ideas or people that want to make something just throw it up on Kickstarter and they get it funded and they make it happen. One of the most famous examples um, is a company called Pebble. Who knows Pebble? Raise your hand if you know Pebble. Okay, I want a few people. Raise your hand if you know the Apple Watch. You've heard of the Apple Watch. Okay, everyone, right? I mean, some people are just lazy. I guess you're too many. <laughs> you're busy, too busy raising your hand in class today. But I know you all know the Apple Watch. So. The Apple Watch, Samsung Gear, all this can owe its, its legacy to uh, the original smartwatch called Pebble. And these entrepreneurs came up with an idea for a, a Bluetooth connected smartwatch and they pitched it to 100 venture capitalists. And 100 venture capitalists said, no. 10 years ago, if that was your situation, you're basically done. You cannot, do, you cannot 
move forward and produce this. And you need like at least a hundred thousand dollars. Like you can't just do it for free. But at that time, Kickstarter existed. And they said, you know what, let's try this on Kickstarter. And we put it up on Kickstarter and they had a demo video and they showed their prototype and they said had a goal of a hundred thousand dollars. If we can get a hundred thousand dollars, we can make this a reality. They ended up with ten million dollars. Not a hundred thousand, not a million, ten million dollars. And that's why, you know, all these other companies realize that there is a market for this to invest in smart gear. But when I saw that, I was like, man, this is amazing. People are being empowered to Kickstarter to just create to solve their own problems. And I thought this was something the Muslim community is in dire need of. Remember I mentioned I studied in Jordan, right? So anyone from Jordan, I'm going to be careful. Palestinian or Jordanian? Palestinian Jordanian. Okay, good. Ninety percent of the Palestinian Jordanian. Okay, so I'm in Palace, uh, Jordan. Uh, I'm taking the taxi ride, and uh, the van goes off. We stop, and I was like, "Hey, you want to wine? Come inside and pray with me." And he's like, "You go, but I, I'm going to smoke." What's the problem with that mindset? What is that mindset? Talk to talk. Does it walk the walk? Okay, yeah. What else? He's putting his own desires before. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. He's thinking too much about what other people are doing to him instead of what he is doing. To yeah, him. we have a, 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 a term for that. What is it? Arrogant? No. Uh, well, the one I'm thinking of, maybe it's a little hard, is victim mindset. Yeah, victim mentality. We're in a victim mentality. That like, oh, everyone's against us and we're helpless. We're powerless. We're always powerless. You know, like someone asked uh, one of the famous like about free will, I was like, do we have free will? And I was like, can you lift one leg? He said, yes. Okay, now lift both legs. You can't, you're going to fall to the ground. Right? We're, there's always a limit to our power, but we, should, we always have agency. There's always something that we can do as Muslims. And the famous hadith of this is the Prophet ﷺ said, even if it's Yom Al-Qiyamah, and you have a, a seed, what should you do? Plant the seed. Are you ever going to see that tree grow? Will anyone ever see it grow? But we always take the action. If we have an opportunity, even imagine, we know this, like if you're uh, completely paralyzed, are you, are you dissolved from the responsibility for prayer? No. No, you can do it with your eyelids. You can't even move your eyes, you can do it in your mind. But you still have to pray five times a day, right? So there's always some agency we can take. And so I thought, seeing all this, I know this is a bit long-winded, but seeing all this, I was like, man, if I could make a Muslim Kickstarter, maybe I could have a platform that really empowers and and motivates and inspires the Muslim community globally, and that led me to create LaunchGood. So LaunchGood is a Muslim crowdfunding site. We help people do all sorts of stuff from launch movies, to do um, very charitable causes, uh, to even uh, responding to tragedies. And a good example of this, one of my favorite examples is here from Montreal, or for, from Quebec, is the case of Eamon Derbali. Uh, who knows the story of Eamon? Anyone know? He was shot. He was shot during the event in Quebec City. Good. So that was about like I think a year and a half ago, in February of 2017. I think it's February. January. Uh, January. January 30, 29th. 29th. Okay. So late January 2017, this white nationalist comes into a mosque and shoots all these people praying, and he killed many of them. I think uh, eight, uh, six or eight something, and. Alhamdulillah, there was a lot of, there's a big launch good campaign and other campaigns that raise a lot of money for the victims and their families. But Eamon was sort of forgotten in this situation. So he charged at the shooter, actually. And he's able to save a lot of lives because of his actions, but he was shot and left paralyzed. And a year later, his situation was very bleak. Like he's you know, completely paralyzed. They lived in an apartment with stairs. His wife would have to carry him. Like, this is a horrible situation. And this article came out in the newspaper, and Muslims were very touched. And so if you know some people like Linda Sarsour, Suhaib Web, like people were calling me like, Chris, can we do something for this, right? And at the same time, some people here from uh, Toronto, um, uh, actually maybe you recognize some of these people. This is my friend Tarek with Dawanet and uh, Canadian Zakat, Muslim Fest. They decided they wanted to lead a campaign, so we brought all these together. We you know, brought their network together with Linda's, with the Imam Suhaib Webs, and all these other people. And we had a campaign to raise money for him to buy him a new house and buy him equipment that allows him to live a wheelchair accessible life. Right? They need special sort of bathrooms, showers, uh, entranceways, etc., etc. And that campaign ended up going viral, alhamdulillah. 
It raised over $400,000. And one of the beautiful things to me about this campaign was how much support it got exactly, not just in terms of dollars, but people. So do the math. How much is the average donation here? Mm -hmm. it, no, yeah. It's about 80 bucks. About $80. It's not a lot, and it's Canadian, so it's even less than that. Right? <laughs> it's not a lot of money for one person. It's not like we had to lock the doors of the masjid in Tarawi and like squeeze people, you know, like turn them upside down and shake every penny out. No, it's just on the internet. If you want to support it, you support it. But because it really touched people's hearts, these people want, you know, sometimes when these tragedies happen, happen you feel so helpless. Like, I wish I could do something, but I'm here and, the, you know, the event happened thousands of miles away. But again, because of the power of internet, we can actually start to do something. Um, and so, alhamdulillah, we ended up raising the money, we shared it with him and his family, and it became one of our most successful and one of our most proud uh, ever campaigns on LaunchGrid, alhamdulillah. So that's an example of LaunchGrid. So where have we come? Um, you know, I mentioned I started this uh, after my film, Bilal Stan, which was 2010. 2011, I, 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 got, I, you know, I really decided I want to go after idea. I enrolled in the incubator program in Detroit. 2012, I found a small angel investor. We hired some developers from Pakistan. Anyone from Pakistan? Okay, no offense, it didn't go so well. <laughs> but it's all right. We have new developers from Pakistan, they're wonderful. But at that time, uh, it took 18 months of development to get the website live. Uh, but finally, in October of 2013, we were up and running. So that's why we're celebrating five years of launch go down from the left. In those first few months, we raised about $75,000. Uh, over the course of the next year, it grew to a million and a half or a little bit more. And then it became six, and then 14, 33. And today we're sitting at, uh, sorry, $55 million raised, alhamdulillah. And over 5,000 campaigns, 120 countries, and almost 300,000 users. Um, and, you know, I'm not brat, it's like, okay, maybe it's a little humble brag, but really, <laughs> my purpose of sharing this is to show you when you're really committed to something and, and you try to do it with that quality that we talked about, whether it's Earth Over Resurrection or Halal Burgers, like if you really are stick with it and uh, you do it the right way and you do it with quality, you will find a market to help lift up your idea and move you forward. And we've got a long way to go. I mean, I'm sure if you guys use LaunchGate, you'd be like, oh, why don't you guys do this and that and that, right? Um, but alhamdulillah, we're, we're blessed. We have a, a really strong team, a very international team. We had a retreat in Malaysia um, in January. And, you know, right now we have people on our team from Singapore, Malaysia, Pakistan. You see, it's, uh, Pakistan's so good. Uh, the UK, Canada, and America. Um, and this is a very common theme. You know, we're, you and I were just talking about, we have a mutual friend, his name is Peter Gould, another convert from Australia. And he has a company called Zalij. Anyone heard of Zalij? Uh, yeah, so you know Zalij. Um, Zalij makes like these dolls called Salam Sisters. They got some other stuff coming out. Well, their CEO is in Toronto. Um, his name's Radwan. He's Trinidadian. He's not even like from Canada. He's Trinidadian. Um, they have staff in, I think, Chile and Dubai and, you know, all sorts, Australia, like all sorts of places. And this is something you'll find is very common is these remote teams. They live off Slack. Um, they're young and they have that Western mindset, but they also have, like, they're very deeply committed to their Muslim values. Um, and for Launch Good, what we like to say is we're not just helping people raise funds. We're changing the narrative of who Muslims are. When we, you know, people say, oh, you're a crowdfunding platform. I was like, I want you to think of us as an inspiration platform. That you can go to the website and always see, like anytime you're feeling down, you go to the website and see Muslims taking action, trying to do something good somewhere in the world. Uh, and for that, I have a short video. Let's see if it plays. This is our recap from last year. Um, hate us. That's the love in the room. As a community, yes, we are heartbroken. We are sad. We have lost all peace and worship. The government have opened fire on a mosque in a suburb of Quebec City in Canada. This is a group of innocents targeted for practicing their faith. Headstones toppled in a Jewish cemetery near St. Louis. Honoring the men, they call heroes. The victims confronted the suspect while he was yelling anti Muslim slurs.
these are some students that raised fifty thousand dollars that ended up winning a million dollar prize from the Holtz Prize. These guys are in Indonesia, they raised four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And this is a women's school in Mauritania. And I, you know, I like to highlight all the good things that are happening around a community. Uh, not just launch good, again, again I, I illustrate the story of launch good for the macro trend to show you that we're one story, but there are actually a lot of these things going on all around us. Um, since I'm going to embarrass him, my friend in back in Jawad, he has a product, for example, called Elegant Spirit. I mentioned it before, uh, but he's doing a lot of other stuff in the community. Right? So he has a full time job, right? You're not living off the elegant spirit, I hope, right? So he's got a full-time job. Chala, the one day. Uh, but he also did a launch good campaign this past spring for a foundation out in California called Taiba Foundation that works with prisoners, uh, Muslim prisoners that get out of prison. And he helped send three Muslims that they work with to the Hajj. And I got to go to the Hajj this year, and I got to meet, uh, what was the brother's name again? Tahir, right? Tahir. I got me by the time I actually ran into him in the Hajj panel of all places, it was just, you know, part of the barakah, the miracle of the Hajj. Uh, and it's an example that you know, so many of us can do something, even if it's a small thing, but they all add up. You know, I, I like to say another thing about Launch Kid, it's a storybook of all the good the Muslims are doing in the world, and every campaign is a chapter in that storybook. Um, so, you know, alhamdulillah, so many we've worked with, and so many cool things. There's another one, anyone know uh, this campaign? Hajj Backpack? Uh, was it Zane, right? Is it? Uh, I don't remember the name, but I saw. Uh, it. I think Zane is his name. He's here. He lives here in Montreal. Great entrepreneur. If you want to meet a good entrepreneur, meet this brother. He went on Hajj. He felt like there should be a backpack custom made for the Hajj, and he ended up doing a launch good campaign, had it very successfully. And then when I went on my Hajj this year, I actually brought the backpack with me. So it's cool. I mean, you're going to see finally like our our community is finding a little bit of its Izzah back again. You know, it's a little bit of its self esteem. Um, and, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, there's just so much great stuff happening here across Canada. You guys should be really proud. And I'll end, I think, the, we're going to do Q&A. You're going to have a lot of time to make comments. I just want to make a dua. Again, I believe that in, in America, or in the West, I should say, we are privileged. We're, we know this. We're very privileged, especially in the Muslim community, because we could do something here that will have a global reach, and Muslims will follow it because we're American or Canadian, like because we're Western. But if we have it with our values, we can have a very positive effect rather than a negative effect on the community. And so I end with this dua of the Prophet Muhammad says, Allah grant us from amongst our children and our spouses the coolness of our eyes. Allah make us a leader for the righteous. So we don't want to just be of the muttaqin, like be of the, the, the righteous, but we want to be of the leadership of them. Uh, and I could say a lot more, alhamdulillah, the Quran is full of like, amazing quotes, but I'll end it there and we'll open up for Q&A. Uh,